Hello and welcome to another video in my adaptive decision making series. Today we're going to talk about looking for the right fight when you're taking small engagements all the time and you're looking to finish your opponent, it can be really, really hard to decide on when to actually take a fight and how are we going to finish the game with just fighting and not actually killing someone in their base. Well, we're going to talk about that today. I'm going to run you through a game here. This is versus B, who I'm sure many of you know. The matchup is Mongol versus HRE. Let's go. All right. The first thing you do, of course, you start off is you want to think about what's your opening strategy. As Mongols, oftentimes you'll find that it can be really good to go for a tower rush. But often a tower rush depends on where your opponent's gold has spawned, where their woodline has spawned, and often their sieves as well. Because if they're a sieve like the Abbasid, they might need stone for um, their second TCs, which they will always go for. If you're up against HRE, you'll need to try to cover their gold with your tower. And there are many ways to defend this. I have a video guide that you guys can check out how to defend tower rushes. This is not a guide on tower rushing, but this is uh, how this tower rush unfolded and um, played out afterwards because it didn't go super well. I'm going to show you how I played around it. First off, just standard economy, opening up with the tower rush here with the wood, saving this villager, and then getting the barracks down. I'm going to speed it up a little bit here. We're still gathering wood, so we can make our spearmen at our tower. And the first thing I see is that he has a pretty good spawn. Whenever you're trying to dark age rush or feudal rush someone, you should scout them pretty early. And so what I did was I went out, I looked a few for a few sheep here around my base, and then I just went straight across to his base. And then what I found was that he had a gold spawn, two gold spawns, plus a stone, plus deer, plus berries, plus extra wood, all in the back. And this is a very, very good spawn for him. The only things that he has in the front is his wood line here, the small one, and the berries and the big wood line. On cliffside, you only have one big wood line, which is something that's worth noticing because most sieves, especially if you're planning on playing longer feudals, will need a lot of wood. HRE will not need a lot of wood because they'll try to fast castle. So what do we do? Well, we'll try to see if we can cover the gold and whatever is covering the gold, whether it's spearmen, whether it's towers, whether it's just nothing, um, which is not what I gather based off of his initial house placement here. Um, I think that he's going to try to defend this, but I don't know how he's going to do it because I haven't scouted it because I also need to have sheep. So my thought process is he puts a house close to the gold like this where I can torture it down without getting fired at by the TC will mean that he will try to defend this. If he had put the t house here, that would mean that he will not try to defend the mining camp. And the moment that I come to the mining camp with my first spearman, that will probably be deleted to deny bounty. So I go around the corner here, I find that he has made a tower. I kill one of the sheep here, I see that he drops the sheep, I try to get another sheep, but that is not possible. I've got my villager coming, I've got my spears, I've committed to the tower, I've gathered the wood that I need to get uh, enough spearmen to get the tower. I need 100 wood for a tower, and I'm making 5 spearmen in total to occupy that tower. But now I cannot really go around here, because this is a super awkward place. I could tower here, but it would not cover the gold. And if I tower it up here, he could pull his villagers and it would still be a hot mess. So what do we do? We put the tower here instead. The reason we put the tower here is because it'll cover the wood line in case that we play an extended feudal. And in case the game goes longer than what this wood up here will give him. Because he's going to put his Aachen Chapel up here, get increased gathering from that. And I'm going to have a tower down here. The moment this wood runs out... The most optimal place for him to gather wood is here. But if that's covered by a tower, that's pretty awkward. So that's the alternative to covering the gold. You actually want to commit to covering a resource with the tower. You don't want to cover the berries. That does not matter. But if you can cover the wood, if you can cover the gold, that's great. Right, enough about the tower. It's just going to sit here for now. I'm not going to upgrade it immediately because he's not going to be there. Now what the plan is, is I'm going to go H up. I'm going up with the silver tree. You can go up with the silver tree. You can go up with the deer stones. In this case, in this scenario, in this matchup, it's probably better to go with the deer stones, simply because we are going to be trying to fast castle. Um, so what I do here is I go for silver tree and I'm going to make a few traders and I'm going to make some Keshiks. So I've got the stable up. I've got my um, silver tree. And now the whole point here is to go and 
do some damage with these. If I cannot find any damage with the silver tree, I'm going to go and I'm going to deny the relics. Because number one thing HRE wants to do is to get the relics. So what he's doing here, he's built a stable, but he's made no horseman. And he's aging up at the same time. This very clearly indicates to me he's going to go ahead and make knights. I need to do something about that. Knights, I cannot really fight with feudal Keshik, so I need to have my spearmen. So I can still make barracks uh, units. I can still make spearmen. I can upgrade the spearmen. I can make the Keshiks. The Keshiks are good for hunting down the prelates, but I need the spearmen to deal with the knights. So there's going to be a lot of engagements happening here because it's not going to be 10 knights versus 10 Keshiks. It's going to be one Keshik here, one knight there, a group of spearmen over here, and then one knight over there to help getting a relic. There's going to be a lot of small engagements here, and it's imperative that I don't lose these units so I can upgrade them in the next age. Double stable now, so he's going to go all in on the knights. This is a good play, because it only requires food and gold from him. He does not need wood. Regnitz comes up now. We delayed it a little bit once here. He discovered there was a tower, so he put it up here, and he couldn't put it there. So now he has to sacrifice farm placement uh, to put it here. Which is a little awkward, but most important, it delays him a bit. At the same time, all this time that he spent on trying to place down the Regnus Cathedral, I was also macroing towards getting a Castle Age. So I had enough resources here, and I go into Coral Time. Now, I didn't go all in on traders. I made five traders in total. Because I need that fast castle. I'm not going to try to win with a better eco this game. The whole point of playing against HRE is denying the relics. If I can get three relics or more, I'm in a very good position. If he gets two or three relics, he's going to be in a fine position as well. So I would like to deny as much as possible. Spearmen are now out. If you have fuel aged spearmen, you can deal with knights pretty well. Um, that's actually not a big problem. Um, what is a problem is Keshiks versus knights. So the Keshiks are used to hunt down the prelates. I actually find the first two prelates here and manage to uh, kill both of them. So these two Keshiks are already gaining a lot of value because they wouldn't be able to take a fight versus the knights. The spears can. A little unlucky charge there into both of my spearmen. That's what happens. Pearl tie is now going to be up. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go for some upgrades. And I'm going to go for a prayer tent, which is essentially just uh, a monastery. But the real cool thing about playing uh, Mongols is you can move this prayer tent. So I already got the movement upgrade from the Ovu. Having this prayer tent and being able to move it makes it so that I can actually grab the relics a lot faster by moving it together with the um, shamans that I have. Here we see a few knights. They're trying to find more damage and they're moving out in groups like this, trying to look for more traders. I think that he thinks he that I had made a lot of traders, that he saw that I went silver tree, that I went for a lot of traders, but stopped doing that. So he's really out to hunt for those traders. I'm going to be chasing these a lot, but the whole point is I secure the relics. If I can have one Keshig up here denying the relics, whilst all his units are trying to uh, find damage down here and they can't, that's great. The whole point is deny those relics. Keshig, going to kill this third prelate now. And I am making my shamans. As we can see, we have four relics on the map currently. Now with this one, that's five. I know that he's going to get this one. I'm just trying to lay it as much as possible. Here comes another prelate. It is a little bit curious that he didn't go and send new units to try to deal with this. But I'm sure that he had a lot of other stuff on his mind as well. Trying to find traders, trying to not lose his knights. So it is understandable. I do lose my Keshik here, but end up killing another Prelate. So this is a very good outcome for me. If I can keep this Keshik alive, that's great. But I actually end up losing it. I bring my Spearman forward. And uh, yeah, I'm going to start moving my Prelate around and grabbing Relics. Speeding up the game a little bit. I'm collecting a lot of wood and I'm going to make some uh, pastures now. Because what is really awkward when you're playing against somebody who has knights out on the map, who has just in general a lot of units raiding, is having a split economy. Having a lot of pocket resources, especially when you can't wall. Mongols can't wall, so the best alternative for me, if I don't have secure food, which I do not, all my food is very far out on the map. Got deers in the middle. 
and just one berry patch here. So for me, the best thing I can do is actually just to make pastures. I do collect the berries here, but that's actually pretty risky. This is not advice to always go farms and pastures. I have covered that topic in the previous video. Um, but here it's basically because it would I'm better off going for the sheep as it is safer, as I cannot really defend the villagers if I decide to go on the boar down here, for example. It's going to cost me a lot of resources that I need to funnel into defending and taking relics. I've got my Kurultai now placed in the middle. Remember, this is cliffside. There's not a lot of space between our bases, which means if I'm going to be around here a lot, I'm going to get my healing, I'm going to get my extra damage, and just in general, a great position for me to have it in. It's not, uh, you know, in danger of getting destroyed, because that's not the type of game we're playing here. It's actually right there, which is great for me, because I'm going to be able to heal. I'm going to be moving a lot around here. One scholar here. Got my first relic. Got a few knights here. He's going to take out this one shaman and probably also the villager, if I remember correctly. I go for a little bit of raiding in, this. in the meantime. It's really important that when somebody raids you, you raid them back. Because if all their focus is on you, and you never, what would you say, focus the game on them instead, they will just keep on attacking and attacking and attacking. And I guess that's one of my main advices here. If you are fighting these types of battles where there are so many knights running around or other fast units and you cannot keep up with them the best thing you can do to turn the game around is actually to raid them so if somebody's outside your base and you force them to go back to their base to defend all of a sudden you get map control you get an opportunity to take advantage of that map control so don't lose the keshiks just run around try to find more damage force them to make towers force them to make defensive units and then look around the map for potential um, villager pickoffs. Take a look at the deers here. There's seven deer. If there were six, there would be villagers there. If this boar is killed, then they're probably gathering there as well. So you're constantly looking for more opportunities to raid. And you don't need to raid with 20 horsemen. You can raid with one Keshek, and that can usually cost a lot of idle time, and you can probably get kills as well. All right. Playing as the Mongols, you have Yam Network in if you go for the deer stones you're playing with the silver tree you can get that upgrade in h3 and i just got that upgrade which means all my units now move at the same speed as his um infantry would do with the uh what's it called the uh speed upgrade they get from the blacksmith so overall this is going to be really good for uh, my mobility and keeping up with him because he could go into anything right now i would expect him to go into archers because archers and knights are just overall a really good composition, and it would deal with the spearmen very well. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware that he can go and get archers with the upgrade and move very quickly, and I will not be able to take fights because he can just kite me. He's a lot faster than me in that way. Got my two archer ranges. I'm going to start making crossbows now. I'm going crossbow, spearmen, which is a very standard composition for any sieve. Um, that could be both aggressive, uh, but it's really just very good with Siege. And then I have my Keshiks, of course. So it's a really nice mix of very high quality units. Another prelate goes down. I have now sent my Prayer Tent and my Shaman. I'm going to go and grab the third relic for me now, because I already have two here back in the base. Because we got the two on the left. Still chasing around here. If I can idle five knights and still get the relics, that's great. This is all about buying more time to make the game better for me and not let him have uh, double income on his uh, relics from the Raidness Cathedral. Now going for the berries there. I've got more pastures coming in. I'm getting my blacksmith upgrades kind of late. This could have been done earlier. Um, but then again, we are playing counter units, spearmen against knights, so it's not something that matters too much because you have bonus damage shamans popping into the prayer tent now and this prayer tent will go back home we've got four relics in total and we are in a really good position because of this i take a very bad fight here going too close to his base not knowing about the archer switch and this caused me to lose a couple of my spearmen 
which is not the best. So I just try to do as much damage to the knights that were there, uh, because I know I cannot outrun him. I don't have my Yam network here. Again, all these small fights... If you lose a lot of these small fights and you just constantly lose units that way, at some point your opponent will have a lot of units and they can just march into your base and you're dead. But if you can try to always have groups around the map that aren't inferior when it comes to counter units and size, then you can always try to get map control that way, find small uh, pockets of resources where he's gathering, find the damage you need. In this game, I have killed not as many villagers as I would have liked to, but at least I killed a lot of prelates. We are pretty similar in eco, but he has more army than I do, and I'm fully aware that he does so. The higher quality army is larger, and I would not be able to take a head-on fight should we just group up and go against each other, which is why we keep playing this game of splitting up our units, of going out and taking sacred sites, of raiding traders, of denying relics. It's all about fate finding all the small advantages that you can find and then in the end you're gonna come out on top because you ended up doing better than your opponent you gathered more resources you denied more resources and overall idled your opponent more that's what this is all about it's very tough to play this playstyle compared to uh boom and just walling up and just sitting in your base but this is a lot more fun and this is also what it takes to really get up to that high level. You gotta be able to defend your traders or uh, go around and actually raid somebody on their boars, on their deers, and taking the right fights. It's crucial. Make full use of your civilization. Use the towers with the Yam network. Place the Kurota in the right position. Make sure that when you make the mistake of going for Silvertree, and you could have gone deer stones instead that that doesn't you know discourage you from playing the game like you can make a mistake that's fine as long as you have a follow-up to that that's gonna mend that mistake here's where the tower comes in again we talked about this tower in the early part of this video this tower is now gonna pay itself off it's been upgraded and so it's really annoying for him because he's trying to gather wood now to make all the archers what i can do here is i can use these crossbows and the spearmen and start picking off knights this tower has been upgraded with 75 total resources plus the 100 base resources that it costs it's 175 resources the moment i kill one knight because of this tower then i get value i've just killed one knight here and then i'm gonna kill a couple more Get a few spearmen pickoffs here. Already now getting a lot of value. Now he has to source most of his army there. And when he comes back around again, I can use my 12 crossbows and one shot his knights. Watch this. One knight goes down. That is 240 resources every time he loses a knight. So this fight here is one of the big reasons that I won this game. Because losing that many knights is some of the worst that can happen to you. He doesn't get any value from taking these fights. And I have the cruel tie, so even if he pushes me here, I can quickly get there with the Yam network and do a lot of damage. So this is a really good um, way into his base to do damage. Two Puritans with two relics each. And I am now going to be going for improved herbal medicine. This is not something you see very often because most people don't go for um, shamans. But because this fight and this the way that this game has gone has been all over the map, me having these shamans can be a great addition when it comes to healing up units that have been fighting, that I've been keeping alive. So it's really a, a good alternative for these types of fights where you're going back and forth, back and forth, and you need to heal. You could say that the Kurul Tai will do that for you, and that is true. You don't need to do shamans, but shamans can still aid you a lot in fights. I now spot that he's gone for the boar. I take my knights and I go over there to the boar. And I stay around with my spearman and my crossbow around where the tower was, where his whole army is. Just try to always pressure your opponent, stay around their base. There's no need for me to sit here when I can sit over here. And then pressure him. Here, I find his boar. I charge into the boar. I don't aim move here. I get on top of his villagers first. Then you kill the villagers. So they have pathing issues. Again, that's a lot to lose. It's a lot of food that he's not getting. And 
these towers have also been upgraded with springled emplacements. So they're incredibly expensive, and he was really trying to get a lot of value here. So taking these villages out, just completely removed that um, advantage there that he was trying to secure. Here we are playing on cliff sides. There's cliffs, obviously. These are natural walls. We can try to use our crossbows up here and potentially get some damage onto these knights that are trying to find my Keshiks. I also have my spears. This is really where the game gets to the climax point, I guess you could call it. This is where the big decisions uh, and micro decisions are made. These fights are going to matter a lot. So what happens here is I spot that he's trying to go around with his knights, trying to go into my eco, and actually managed to take this out when I was also pressuring a little bit with a few units here. So he's focused on this. I take out all these knights, and this is actually where I win the game. This might not seem like a lot, but this was eight knights, maybe? Time that with 240 resources. That's a lot of resources. You could almost have aged up with that. This is where things get really, really complex. We have uh, Stealth Forest here. This Stealth Forest is giving me a single opportunity to make a quick Manginal. He knows I do not have Siege. I do not have a single workshop. But he does not see behind this. And I've gone for the improved Siege Engineering in the meantime. He's running only Archers, but with Prelates. Which means these guys do a lot of damage. It's Inspired Warriors. I'm building a mangonel here, and he will not see this mangonel until it starts firing. Mangonel comes out, misses the first shot, but he's moving too far forward. He doesn't see the stealth forest. More so than just a mangonel, all my army is also uh, stealthed in there, so I can get a really good first strike here. See the knights come around. The mangonel fires again. The... Keshiks come back around. I don't want to lose this Manganel. If I lose the Manganel, my crossbows and spearmen are countered. That's why the archers are so good here. I can expect him now to get Springles himself or, or Manganels. And those will be able to take out this very Manganel. It's really important that I'm aware of that fact when we take the final fight. Because this was once again just a skirmish. Doing damage. Just trying to find small advantages all the time. He comes in with his own Manganel. Spears are put onto his knights. Crossbows A moved. The Manganels have been shift clicked onto the knights. Movement arrow has been issued onto the Keshiks so they can quickly go and kill the Manganel. Crossbows move to the side, try to avoid damage. And now I can A move the crossbow. Manganel onto the archers. I'm fighting under the curl tie with Yam Network. No, not with Yam Network. This is really how you want to be finishing games like this. You find those small points where you can take a fight like this and then you win the game because what are they going to do now? They're completely convinced that you have won because you took small engagements across the entire battlefield uh, throughout the entire game. You did not sit in your base and ultimately you found those small value uh, targets all of the time. A villager here and a villager there, a few knights here, a few arches here and all of uh, and in the end that's really what makes these high level games ultimately super entertaining to watch but this is also what we should learn from them that if you're playing games like this where there's so much happening on the map you have to be on the map that's it for me if you're interested in coaching check out the end screen that will be coming here in just a second and uh, if you have any questions leave them down in the comment section below i'll do my best to answer them and have a good day